Families have a lot going on. Let Ollie help manage the mental load with new cognitive health supplements for everyone four and up, like delicious Lolly Focus Pops or Lolly Mellow Pops for kids. And for parents, try three new Brainy Chews to help you focus, chill out, or get energized. Find these cognitive health buddies for the whole fam at ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hello, Beat Check listeners. This is Shane Dixon Cavanaugh, Portland City Hall reporter for the Oregonian Oregon Live, and your host today. As many listeners know by now, Oregon ranks miserably when it comes to addressing residents' mental health needs compared to the rest of the U.S. Especially troubling, our state is dead last, the absolute worst in the nation, in balancing the prevalence of youth mental illness with access to care. That's left many families with a teen in crisis or struggling with addiction no choice but to send them out of state for treatment. But efforts are also underway to fill some of the most glaring gaps in Oregon's youth mental health system. Joining me today is my colleague, Nicole Hayden, who recently published a three-part series on youth mental health in our state. Nicole, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So you've written that Oregon has the most youth ages 12 to 17 who have reported having a mental illness, and that's about 21%. Yet the state has struggled to keep services for them open and operating consistently. How slim are the current options here? Um, what can you tell us? Yeah, uh, it's pretty slim. Um, you know, Oregon has 327 licensed mental health beds for youth. But um, when you look at actually the number of beds that are staffed, we only have about 280. And then as you get down to decide like if your child needs addiction treatment or mental health treatment, um, there's even fewer options. So as you get more specific, there are fewer and fewer beds available that families are competing for against other families. And tell me about some of the families you spoke to for this series. And by the way, listeners, uh, as usual, we will include links to all of these articles in our show notes. And I strongly urge you to, to read all of the pieces in this series because it was excellent. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of the families you spoke to, Nicole, uh, tell us a little bit about what they had to do to get help for their teens in this context. Yeah, so um, one father I spoke to said he called nearly 30 uh, facilities for his teen who had relapsed. Um, and you know, some told him they didn't accept teens. Some said they didn't accept teens with substance use disorder. Some didn't have clinical detox, which is needed if uh, a child is going through a painful uh, detox um, from opioids or something. And uh, many others just said they weren't accepting new patients and they didn't even offer a wait list. So this a uh, parent, like many other parents I spoke to, ended up spending a lot of money to send their child out of state. Um, this family paid 3300 out of pocket because their insurance covered a big portion of the cost. Another family I spoke to who also sent their child out of state paid $11,000 because they could only find a facility that was out of their insurance network. Um, So it's taking a lot of time, a lot of money, uh, and every day that you wait to get your child in care is one extra scary day that you're afraid they might overdose or not make it. And I'm just curious, uh, how comfortable were these families with talking about just these deeply challenging scenarios and situations with their with their young ones um, were they open to talking with you about this or I mean how did that process go overall yeah it's a very vulnerable topic um, I think because there's so many stereotypes maybe people just assume that if a child is struggling like this um, their parents may have been out of the picture or not supportive but that's not the case um, You know, a lot of these parents fought day after day for their child, and a lot of them, when I spoke to them, had just had been 
fighting for years and they just felt exhausted and they knew it wasn't just affecting them. So they felt like they needed to speak out and needed to share their stories so that the people who make decisions could understand how hard it is and understand what's needed. Mm. And that really, you know, not just the parents, but the teens, they also know what they need and they want to advocate for themselves so other people other teens don't go through the same thing so uh, they were very open to sharing their vulnerable stories letting us into their family into their homes letting us follow along to after school activities and really just welcomed us with open arms and about how much time altogether did you spend with some of these teens and their families well, I visited the school about once a week for about 10 weeks. Um, some days I would be there all day just hopping from class to class. Um, I played badminton with them in gym class, which I'm very bad at, apparently. Um, but then we also followed them to their like after-school skateboarding night and hung out with them there. And then we also followed one student to a horse rescue where she spends a lot of time um, and feels support from the woman who owns the horse rescue, who's also in recovery. And so we spent a lot of hours uh, following her around there, um, talking with her mother and uh, yeah, going to homes of other families. And, you know, one of the things that came across in your series and some of the reporting that we've done elsewhere at the Oregonian recently is that Oregon leaders have finally and recently started investing more heavily in the state's beleaguered behavioral health system. But how much of the $200 million that was part of the Measure 10 rollback earlier this year, how much of that is going to youth-focused addiction treatment and care? Yeah, the short answer is none. Um, Longer answer is that some of that money is going to community care. So that means if a child is trying to access a therapist, so like outpatient care, maybe that broadened the options for them. But we do know a lot of outpatient therapy um, doesn't really focus on children because it's harder and more expensive to provide that care. Uh, But none of this money went to creating any additional mental health, substance use, or detox beds uh, for children. And what did families who you spent time with reporting on the story have to say about that, if anything? They're just very frustrated. They don't understand why youth aren't being prioritized. Um, You know, I also report on homelessness, and there's many people I have worked with that said their issues started when they were young, in high school, middle school, and they didn't get the help they need. So when we talk about stopping, you know, the flow of homelessness, the flow of addiction, um, it makes sense that we would invest in youth. And so a lot of parents feel just very frustrated and don't understand why there's not more attention paid. And throughout this project, you spent quite a bit of time reporting in Lake Oswego, of all places. Uh, you alluded to the school a little bit earlier, but you know why this school uh, in Lake Oswego? What is it and what were you doing there? Yeah, it's a recovery high school, which means it's an alternative high school for students uh, overcoming their substance use disorder. And that means um, there is recovery mentors there. There is a therapist on staff. Uh, They get real-time help during the day. Their resource mentors help connect them to outside care as well and help them if they need to go back to an inpatient care facility. So it's very much a wraparound kind of support system. Um, It's a place where students don't have to feel ashamed of what they've been through, but they can feel empowered. And it's one of two recovery high schools in the state, and it's the first one that um, ever opened. And the principal is very... uh, the principal really cares about advocating for more resources, and she really encourages the kids to use their experience to kind of advocate for other students and give them a platform to share their stories, and she'll take them to the legislature or 
to community events to share uh, their experiences. And it just happens to be located in Lake Oswego because there is a building there specifically um, marked for uh, vulnerable youth. And so it made it an affordable place to open the school. But um, it serves the Tri-County area and most students there are not from the Lake Oswego School District. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the name of that school is Harmony Academy, right? Correct. And when exactly did the school open? How long has it been operating for? Harmony Academy opened about six years ago. And you said that it was it, that it's only one of two, two schools like this in the entire state right now. Correct. But the state um, is providing funding for nine total schools uh, by 2029. So that means seven additional schools will be able to open soon. And in addition to those seven additional schools coming on board, are there signs that more help is on the way for young people struggling with mental health and addiction in Oregon? There are definitely um, smaller organizations working with the state to get money to expand inpatient services for youth and to also think more creative, think more about how we can provide students with different kinds of therapy after school. Um, and so I think there are small signs that we're moving forward, but I don't think we've seen a big signal from the state that they're about to dump a lot of money into this. And in terms of the teens and youth that you spent a lot of time with and their families, I mean, are there particular things that they're advocating for, asking more for from state and local leaders that just aren't coming on board at this time? Yeah, they need uh, more providers that are trained to work with youth because what's successful in therapy for an adult is different than what's successful for a teenager. Um, and that might take a different kind of training. They also want um, psychiatrists who feel comfortable subscribing medication to treat opioid disorder for youth, um, which some providers uh, don't feel comfortable with yet, even though that's medical best practice. They also want um, more therapists that can treat both mental illness and substance use disorder at the same time. Often, a therapist only can do one or the other based on their training and experience and comfort level. And then also the teens shared that they want better like crisis lines. So if they are struggling in the middle of the night and maybe they don't feel like they can call their therapist at 3 a.m. or wake up their mom or something. They want a crisis line that feels human and empathetic and that really walks them through those big feelings in that moment. And sort of the last thing I wanted to discuss with you about your project and series on teen mental health is one of the components to the piece was that you actually, you and uh, Vicki Connor from our newsroom worked with the students themselves to do some really amazing photo, video, and other multimedia components uh, to, to help tell this story. Can you talk a little bit more about what you all did together? Yeah, so when I was first starting uh, to interview uh, students, I was struck by how eloquent they were and how insightful they were about what they needed and what their experience was. Um, and hearing it in their voices, their very youthful voices was very compelling. And I wanted other people to be able to hear that because no matter how I could write it myself, um, it still would not get close to being able to hear a very childlike voice talk about what they went through and what they know they need. And I also wanted to give them the platform to tell policy leaders what mattered to them and show what they uh, felt was meaningful in their lives, since we know a lot of decisions are often made without ever talking to youth. Um, and we really wanted to give them an opportunity to feel empowered and proud of what they have overcome. 
and we wanted to really show uh, how lovely they were like throughout the day in school, what life looked like, how healthy they were. And we also gave one student um, some disposable cameras to kind of <laughs> capture her favorite parts of the day. And, you know, she took some photos of staff members at the school and went on a senior ski trip and took the cameras there. And, you know, that made her and the other students feel very excited and like they were kind of leading this project and we weren't just here kind of showing trauma, but showing hope and they appreciated that. Well, Nicole Hayden, thank you so much for joining me today to talk a little bit more about your really remarkable series. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Beat Check with the Oregonian. If you like this show, give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And tell a friend. Help spread the word. The best way to support our journalism and stories like this one is with a subscription to the Oregonian Oregon Live. You can do that at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Until next time.